Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, let's see, administratively, a uh, couple of, oh, I guess, one announcement, right? The homework one is due today. Uh, please send that to me. Um, we'll try as an email attachment. Um, I think that'd probably be the easiest. Uh, by the end of the day today, we'll say uh, 5 o'clock. I think that's what I put in the syllabus. Um, if you're having trouble with any of those problems, um, please reach out. Also, uh, questions on homework 2, which was posted uh, yesterday, um, are also welcome. Um, I've gotten a few questions uh, through Microsoft Teams, like in the, in the general sort of discussion thread. Um, that works fine. I'm happy to answer those. Um, uh, but if you'd like to uh, do a, a video call or um, or just call me on my cell phone to discuss any of that stuff, um, I'd be more than happy to do that. I'm trying to get this video posted a little bit earlier uh, today and uh, to just make a general effort to get ahead of this a little bit so that you guys can have the video for the day. Uh, first thing, uh, I know I said yesterday this would be posted first thing, but life happens. Um, but uh, I'll, get it up as, I'll get it up as soon as I can. So um, let's switch over to the notes. So share that with you. So we can talk about chapter eight. So chapter eight is about failure. And I think um, if you look at mechanical properties of materials, right, one of the first things that we, we started with was a stress strain curve. And um, I don't have one in this set of notes, but uh, you all should know what that uh, looks like um, uh, by now, right? And it, it sort of forms kind of the rough outline of sorts for the last couple of chapters that, that we've covered, right? The, the first one, mechanical properties of materials, we're mostly interested in that um, initial part of the stress strain curve, right? We, we have a constant slope, and that represents the elastic uh, deformation of our, of our sample um, up to the yield point. And then last uh, lecture, chapter seven, was about dislocation motion, which is, for metals, the mechanism by which um, plastic deformation is achieved, right? So we're moving atoms around and uh, deforming our, our sample or our part. Um, and then once you get beyond a certain point there, um, you start to neck the sample, right? So I have extreme deformation and then eventually at the end of the stress strain curve, right, you have fracture. And so we've already talked about the elastic region talked about the plastic region, now we're going to talk about the, uh, the eventual failure of a part. Um, and, uh, you know, I introduced it talking about stress-strain curve, but as we'll see if we go through these, these notes, that um, the kind of failure you see in a tensile test where you just continuously increase the load until the sample fails is not indicative of the type of failure you see in the real world, right? Because a tensile test, you can predict the stress at which that instant failure will happen. And so you don't design a part to ever see that stress or, you know, or the environment. Um, and uh, the failure modes we'll talk about here are, are failure modes that are, that exist at, that can exist at much lower uh, stresses, right? And that's important that they be understood because um, having failure uh, at design stresses um, is is a, is a problem, right? That's a real bad thing. So we want to engineer our materials and our parts to resist that type of failure. Anyway, okay. So <clears throat> so we know from tensile testing what sort of stresses our materials can withstand. And so, you know, you would design your, uh, your material to be below the yield stress, right? So you'd say, okay, this is always going to be, be fine. Um, the problem is that parts and materials are not manufactured perfectly, 
um, there are always uh, flaws, imperfections, and um, sometimes we put them there, right? Well, rarely, but sometimes, right? The flaw is there actually for our benefit, right? So Callister uses this example of a uh, candy wrapper where they always, uh, well not always, but oftentimes we put a little uh, slit in the edge, right? So that if you tear it right there, you can tear it open easily. And you don't have to fumble with trying to get, trying to get your package open. Um, and the reason is, is that when you apply a, a stress right at that point, um, that notch or that little, that little uh, cut um, acts as a stress concentrator. Right? So we see that that can be beneficial. It can also be really detrimental. Right? So Callister also cites this example of a World War II, I think this is an oil tanker, um, and uh, it had a, a crack propagate from, I think, the corner of a bulkhead, right, all the way around the ship and broke it in two. Now, this is also, you know, we'll talk about this later on in these notes, um, an example of a ductile to brittle transition, right? And, and we'll see that uh, crack propagation is uh, much different in brittle and ductile materials, right? So when we have that becomes especially dangerous here when you have this transition um, because we rely on ductile materials to resist crack propagation and when they transition and become brittle um, the cracks can propagate very rapidly okay so um, that's sort of a bit of an introductory uh, kind of jumping back in, into this particular uh, page we have um, okay so what do we mean by fracture we're talking about uh, separation into multiple pieces due to applied stress at low temperatures, right? So this temperature part, um, we will uh, will come into play a little bit later when we're talking about creep, but generally we're talking about lower temperatures for fracture. And I've already mentioned a little bit here, but there are two modes, right? We have ductile and brittle. We want ductile um, crack propagation for two reasons. One is that if we have a ductile material, um, there is uh, it has the ability to deform, as we saw last uh, lecture, um, and uh, that deformation is going to require energy, right? And so um, that makes it stable, right? You're not going to have sort of a runaway situation where energy is released by opening the crack. Um, which leads to the crack opening further, and you have this sort of self-reinforcing cycle. If it requires energy, then it's going to be kind of negative feedback, where it um, has, has a tendency to slow the crack growth um, rather than accelerate it. Um, and also, if the crack uh, requires energy, then it's going to grow more slowly, and we're going to see the, the material change shape. Right? We'll see a bulge due to the deformation, or a bend, or, um, or a tear, or something that would give us an indication that a crack is propagating, um, which allows us to take action before we have catastrophic failure. So a ductile is, is different than that, right? Ductile, or I'm sorry, brittle is much different than that, and it fails catastrophically, right? And so um, we don't want that to happen, right? If we're going to have failure, we want the chance to, to catch it and uh, take that part out of service or make a repair and so forth. And uh, cracks uh, or fracture has uh, two stages, right? First is uh, crack formation, right? So the start of a crack, and then we have crack growth or crack propagation. Like I said a minute ago, crack propagation in ductile and brittle materials uh, is quite different ductile we have again deformation at the crack which slows it makes it uh, stable and um, dependent on a stress increase right so um, the crack will grow to a certain length and then if it sees a higher stress um, only then will it continue to grow um, you know when you think about this what, what happens to ductile materials when they plastically deform right, we talked about last week Went out last lecture that um, plastic deformation 
leads to the production of more dislocations, right? So plastic deformation is work hardening or strain hardening, right? So that's what's happening at the uh, front of this crack at, where we have lots of plastic deformation, right? The material at the, at the, the end of the crack is actually getting stronger as it plastically deforms, right? Which helps to uh, slow the crack growth and requires a stress increase, right? Because it's actually stronger now. You need to have more stress than you did before. Uh, again, brittle is, is much different. Uh, it's a brittle material, so brittle materials don't deform, right? Um, and the crack can grow rapidly. You don't have plastic deformation to uh, strain harden material or to uh, absorb some of that energy, right? So it grows very quickly and is unstable. Um, uh, failure of uh, tensile specimens for ductile materials, right? We've already seen a little bit of this necking just from our discussion of stress strain curves. Um, and if you have a material, a metal, that is extremely soft and ductile, right? Thinking something like gold, um, it will neck down almost to a point, right, where you get almost complete reduction in area. Um, for materials that are ductile but not quite so soft and ductile, um, you get sort of a, a partial necking um, to where you neck down to a point, but then uh, remember as I'm necking down with plastically deforming, this is getting uh, strain hardened, it's getting uh, harder and less ductile, more brittle, right? And so as that proceeds, right, we're going to be less likely to see a pure ductile failure here. And actually, you know, you don't. Um, after the necking uh, happens, you start to form, I'll jump down here, you start to form these microvoids in the interior. Um, and as we'll see later, right, these microvoids form stress concentrators, which grow into cracks. Eventually the crack will... Um, Will, the, the voids will coalesce and the crack will grow all the way around and you'll get um, a fracture surface that has this sort of cup and cone morphology and um, you can see that if you look at the surface under a scanning electron microscope you can see like the halves of the microvoid which appear to be dimples and um, in the interior of the cup they look more roundish, and on the uh, the lip, right? They're they're elongated, and this you know brings up an important point that we'll we'll cover on uh, talk about more later as we move through these notes, is that the fracture mechanism is uh, studied very often through um, SEM imagery, and provides important clues, right? The morphology of the surface provides important clues about um, what is actually occurring during fracture and can be uh, quite useful in determining um, the mode of, of crack propagation and the, and the, the properties of the material. Okay. So ductile um, materials, you have necking, you have these microvoids that, that occur. If you uh, were to examine the fracture surface of a brittle material, you see something quite different. Um, you don't see deformation, so there's no necking, and you have a, a relatively flat fracture face that is perpendicular to the applied stress. Um, and instead of seeing microvoids, you see chevrons, right? So you have these V-shaped chevrons oftentimes that point back to the initiation site. So here I had the beginning of my crack and it grew this way um, and I have these fan-like ridges or chevrons or in ceramic materials I might, have in, I might even see a, a shiny surface. Um, and so this flat surface here um, doesn't um, right, uh, it doesn't follow the grain boundaries, right? You can imagine the, if you look at the grain structure of most materials, right, it's not flat. And so to have this flat, shiny surface, right, we're going to have to cleave um, across the grain. Um, and that's what happens with brittle materials, right? The crack will propagate and break bonds and cleave 
uh, clear through through the grains. It doesn't follow the um, the grain boundaries at all. Um, okay. So uh, clearly, um, different materials fracture in different ways, much different ways. One of which is um, manageable ductile materials, right? Those sorts of failures can be um, managed more easily without loss of life or property because of their um, the the slowness with which the cracks propagate and grow and the signs that they leave behind. Um, brittle materials are much more dangerous because of the catastrophic nature of the failure. And so um, in designing safe and economic um, things out of, out of these materials, um, it's important to have a good understanding, or to study at least, um, the fracture mechanics, to understand what the relationships are between various material properties, right, to measure those material properties, and the relationships between the properties and the stresses that the part will see, and the flaws that are incorporated in the part during manufacture and during service, and how pro cracks propagate, so that we can understand and predict um, these structural failures, right, and, and even maybe design um, new materials new microstructures and new uh, ways of designing parts to minimize the likelihood of, of, a, of a catastrophic failure due to, um, due to a crack. <clears throat> okay, so uh, at the very beginning of this set of notes, we looked, we saw the candy wrapper and we said, okay, if you put a little notch in the, in the edge, you can easily tear it open, right? Well, why, why is that? And I mentioned that that little notch forms a stress concentration. So if you apply a stress right there, um, you will easily tear the plastic, even though um, it would be hard to, to tear it otherwise. And if you um, take that and sort of uh, expand it to a tensile specimen that has, say, a notch or a hole, um, if you were to make a, a flaw like this, um, what happens is if, you, if you're applying a stress to that tensile specimen, right, um, it needs to bear the load even though it has this defect. Um, and I'm going to have a kind of lines of force that are uh, traversing through the material, right, throughout its whole cross-section. Remember uh, St. Venant's principle we talked about with stress-strain curves where we have a long enough gauge length section that we would have a uniform stress here. So, so it's uniform, other, you know, in, in a pristine sample, it would be completely uniform all the way across the cross section. But if I put a hole there, right, obviously a hole is not going to transmit any load. Um, and so the load that would normally be borne by the material in this region where this, this hole or this crack is, um, that, that load needs to be borne by the material around it, right? And so these lines of force are diverted and go around that stress concentrator, um, which makes the edges of this crack um, much higher stress than they would otherwise be, and that exists in the rest of the material, right? And so um, we have a situation where the stress applied may be um, below the yield stress. But once I have this flaw, I have this stress concentration factor that uh, produces um, stress that is above my yield stress, right? And so I will yield the material. I will deform the material and the crack will grow at, that, at the tip of the crack due to this stress concentration factor. Um, and not only cracks, but any place where we have a, an abrupt transition, right? So if you have um, a part that has a sharp corner or a surface scratch or, or a notch cut into it, right? All of those form um, sharp concentration um, factors and can be the source of a crack. Um, and if we go back to that example with the ship, right? 
uh, one of the example one of the this grew from the sharp corner of a bulkhead um, and so one way that you can uh, address this is by designing rounded corners and we'll see that um, an example of that later in these notes um, Okay, so you have these stress concentrators, and if you compare ductile and brittle materials, you know, a ductile material, again, it deforms, right? It is capable of plastic deformation. And so that allows the, 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 um, the stress at the tip of this crack to be redistributed um, due to this plastic deformation, right? So um, the, the intensity of the, the stress concentration can be blunted somewhat. Um, brittle materials can't do that. So when the stress builds up, it's it's there, um, and the, and the crack continues to grow, and the stress doesn't go away, which is part of the reason why they fail so rapidly through crack propagation. Um, and so if you um, make some assumptions about the geometry of these things. Um, you can uh, develop expressions to estimate what this stress concentration factor is. And this expression here is, is um, one example of, of those sorts of relationships. And it includes the applied stress, uh, sigma naught, or yeah, I think that's sigma, right? Anyway, and A, which is the radius or which, sorry, which is the crack length, and uh, rho sub t, which is the radius of the crack tip, right? So you can see here that as the crack gets longer, uh, the stress concentration goes up, which makes sense because if I have a longer crack in here, right, more of those, uh, more of the stress that would normally be borne by that material needs to go around that crack, right? So the longer this gets, the more I have those lines of force piling up. It also goes up as the um, radius of curvature of the crack tip goes down, right? So as this is sharper, the stress is concentrated more, right? Which ought to make sense too, because I'm forcing more of those more of those uh, lines of force right through a smaller area, and so I get a bigger stress concentration factor. Um, and uh, similarly, you can define uh, what we call the critical stress for crack propagation. Um, and here, this would be sort of, uh, you know, you, you have a stress concentration factor, right? So I apply a load, it gets concentrated to this point. If this value here, sigma sub m, right, is greater than this sigma sub c critical stress for crack propagation, then the crack will grow. And this involves um, A again, right? So this critical stress propagation I see is lower as the crack gets longer, right? Which should make sense. Um, it would, you know, a longer crack would would, would take um, less uh, critical stress to grow, right? I've I've weakened the material as the crack gets gets um, gets longer and longer. At least I've weakened this particular sample, um, its cross section. Um, and here's what, in this expression here is where the first time we see uh, other material properties um, factoring into this this um, consideration of, of fracture mechanics, right? Where we see the elastic modulus show up, and this tells us that stronger materials to begin with require more stress to propagate a crack, which should should make sense, right? Um, a strong material should take more force to break it. Um, and then I also have this specific surface energy term um, uh, thrown in there as, as well. So we have this critical stress for, for crack propagation. And um, that leads to a new material property for the purposes of fracture toughness. Um, that would be, uh, yeah, the, called fracture toughness. Um, in you know sort of fraction mechanics, I guess, and this is a factor that describes the resistance of a material to brittle fracture, right? When you have a a, a crack already present, um, we use case you know K sub, sub C as the fracture toughness, and it includes 
uh, a couple of parameters, right? One would be this uh, critical stress for crack propagation. Then we have y, which is uh, usually, at least in the, for the, the cases we'll look at, y is about is it just about one. But it's a dimensionless parameter that um, allows the, um, the impact of the load applied and the sample size and shape and the crack size and, and sort of the uh, all of the other parameters of an experiment can sort of be buried inside of this y parameter. Um, but for most cases here, we'll assume it's about one. And so we really just have this critical stress concentration or this critical stress for crack propagation. And then we have A. Um, so we see that the fracture toughness will uh, um, go up, right, when we require more stress to grow the crack um, for a given crack size, right? So these are, you know, sigma sub C, the critical stress, and the A are, are linked because I have A inside of here. But if I, you know, if I fix... Um, if I fix A, then I would say my fracture toughness goes up as my critical stress is higher for certain materials. Um, but if I were to have A go up, right, where I have a longer crack, and yet I still have the same fracture toughness or the same critical stress factor for crack propagation, then I would say my fracture toughness is, is greater right, for that material. And there are different modes. Um, Callister talks about uh, modes, I think one, two, and three, uh, where mode one has no shear, and then two and three, I think, are, are shear in, in different directions or, or torsion. Um, and so, since this is sort of an introduction, um, we'll just kind of stick with mode one, which is easiest to think about. And in this case, we just have uh, tensile forces, right? So we're pulling perpendicular to the direction of the crack. So we're pulling it apart as opposed to sliding um, and any of that as crack faces. And if we assume that the thickness of our sample is much greater than the length of our crack, right, then we can um, simplify uh, from this critical stress um, to, just, you know, to just stress. Um, and in most cases, right, we'll look at this fracture toughness value, and it is on the order of, say, 10 to 100 times greater for ductile materials than it is for brittle materials. <clears throat> okay, so that gives us some design parameters when we are looking at um, different materials as compared to one another, and also um, the constraints of any particular um, part uh, design. And um, so this leads us to care about in terms of fracture mechanics, right? The fracture toughness of the material that we choose, the stress of our, of our design um, environment or um, the strength of, you know, the size and shape of our part, it produces certain stresses, and then also how big of a flaw are, can we tolerate? And that, that drives how much quality control and uh, inspection we need to do. And uh, these factors are, are linked, and so if you um, have two of those factors fixed by, you know, other factors, you know, um, outside of your control, then you have to design within the third, right? So for instance, if my material selection is already made um, and the manufacturing method is already chosen and the inspection methods are already in place, right? Then the fracture toughness and the flaw size initially are fixed, right? And so that gives me a, a, a mass, a, a max, um, allowable stress, I always forget what this term is, critical stress for crack propagation. Um, and so, right, now I can't design beyond this stress level given the fracture toughness and the flaw size that I have. Um, also, if I, if I have the material chosen and the part design 
and use chosen, meaning that the stress that the part will see is fixed also, right? Now I, I need to design within the allowable uh, flaw size, right? So this may drive, you know, the fixing of these factors may drive the maximum allowable flaw that, that I can have, which, which might require more extensive inspection um, uh, before putting a part uh, into service initially or back into service after, you know, some sort of interval. Okay, so um, we've covered a little bit about fracture um, in general, introduced some material properties, fracture toughness in particular, and now um, we'll look at some of the, the testing. So um, these fracture, these material properties, uh, generally we, we have to measure them. Um, and uh, fracture toughness requires a different sort of testing than, than a typical uh, tensile test. Um, and they usually, they, there's, there's two main ones, the, um, the Sharpie V-notch and the IZOD test. These are uh, standardized tests, so there's an ASTM standard written about them, about how to perform them, which is good because you want to do it the same every time so that you can compare um, results. But in general, both of these tests have, have uh, you know, kind of different differences, but, but they're, they're very similar in, in, in their major respects. Um, the first is that there is usually a pre-existing defect, right? So there'll be a notch cut into the sample, right? So this is your stress concentrator. And then you're going to load this sample very rapidly, right? So you're not going to have a static or slowly increasing stress like you would in a tensile test. Um, you're going to load it very rapidly and um, you're going to uh, grow that crack and have the sample fail um, rapidly, right? And these tests are relatively simple. They don't, they don't require, you know, electronic control or anything. So um, these were developed many years ago um, in response to being able to kind of quantify in some respects the fracture toughness of various materials even though the field of fracture mechanics was still um, developing. And it gives you kind of a, a quantitative, a relative quantitative sense of what the fracture toughness is because say for instance um, the, the, uh, these tests typically have a, a weighted pendulum, right? So I'll have some sort of a weight that swings down and impacts into my notched specimen. And if I lift it up to a certain height, right, I've given that weight a certain amount of potential energy. And so as it swings down, right, that potential energy is converted to kinetic energy, and then it breaks the sample. And that breaking of the sample absorbs some energy, right? And so on the back swing, it will come up less as the fracture toughness goes up, right? Because more fracture toughness means more plastic deformation, or it means more absorption of energy. And so I can, I can look at the upswing on the other side, right? And that gives me an indication of how tough that sample is, at least relative to other samples that are tested in this exact same way. Okay. And one of the things that this test was used initially to determine was the cause of incidents like this ship uh, cracking in two, right? And this was due to uh, a ductal to brittle transition. And so a test like this enables you to determine at what temperature um, a metal may exhibit a transition from a ductile state to, to a brittle state. Um, you just can, uh, you just need to uh, do the test at multiple temperatures and plot the impact energy. Um, and you can see where the impact energy drops off is where you have your transition to um, brittle failure. And you can define this transition um, temperature uh, couple of different ways, right? It depends on kind of how you define it. Are you looking at a 50% reduction in impact energy or, you know, 100% kind of how, how you define it determines exactly where, where the transition happens. But you can see um, 
you can see it occurring as, as you plot this data. Um, you can also get insight into the nature of the fracture by looking at the fracture surfaces, right? So after I cut my notch and I break it with this test apparatus, right, I can look at the surface and, and see, do I see a flat surface with no, uh, no deformation? Or do I see um, <clears throat> necking and microvoids, right? What's the morphology? That gives me uh, an idea in addition to the impact energy of what sort of failure mechanism that I'm talking about. And uh, this ductal to brittle transition is not universal by any stretch. It's actually uh, limited mostly to uh, low strength BCC steel. Um, other materials have differences in fracture toughness. For instance, um, Aluminum and copper are consistently tough, right? These are relatively ductile, and uh, although weaker, um, and high-strength steel and titanium, while you know stiffer and stronger, are more brittle, right? Again, we have this trade-off between strength and ductility, um, but at least you know they have higher and lower values for fracture toughness, but but it's consistent with temperature. Um, uh, BCC steel. Uh, generally uh, displays this brittle to ductile transition and the transition temp is not always constant right so it, it depends on the, mic the microstructure and the impurity content so as you refine the grains of this uh, material of BCC steel um, you can suppress the transition temperature right so make it transition at lower temperatures but as I increase the carbon content, right, it takes it the other way to, to, uh, to higher temperatures. Um, you can also see here that um, as I increase the carbon content, right, the, the range of temperatures over which the transition occurs becomes more, more broad, right, here, really low carbon content, right, I see a very abrupt transition, even though the temperature is, is, is quite a bit lower. Okay, so crack propagation and uh, brittle ductile transitions, um, those are all, um, in well, those are in response to a, a relatively large stress, right? So we saw in, in crack growth that we were talking about reaching a critical threshold of stress to grow the crack. And for ductile materials, um, that threshold keeps increasing. And so you might think that there's still some threshold that you can design underneath and not have to worry about it. And that's not true either, um, because we have um, another failure mode, and that is fatigue. And so fatigue is actually the most common failure mode, right? 90% of failures can be attributed to fatigue. And this one is um, uh, even more important because it, it can occur um, rather suddenly. It also is, um, uh, it occurs at, at low, at low stresses. And, and what we're, ha what you have, have with fatigue is that it's essentially, um, constant growth of, of flaws over, over time, right? Over many cycles of applied stress. So you can have, in, in, in most applications, right, you have um, cyclic stresses, right? So for instance, like an aircraft wing, right? Every time you take off and land, right, you have um, stresses that, um, that are applied and then removed. Um, and so, uh, you know, each of these cycles uh, produces, you know, some microscopic amount of damage, but over time, right, can be, um, can lead to failure of the part. And so, um, fatigue is something that needs to be understood also, and is something that's also tested. And um, in a fatigue test, what you do is you, instead of applying a, a steadily increasing uh, force or, or load, until failure like you would in a traditional tensile test. In a fatigue test, you actually have a cyclic load, right? So you will apply, say, a load intention, right? 
and then maybe a compressive load. Um, and uh, you can define this sort of loading curve um, in any number of ways, but, but you typically, it's typically sinusoidal, right? And can be uh, adjusted uh, to have different mean stress, right? So if it's fully reversible, right, then you would have a mean stress of zero, where you go into tension. And then in compression at the same stress level, just opposite direction. Um, the amplitude can be adjusted where your peak stress relative to your to your mean is is uh, higher or lower, um, and that defines the uh, the conditions under which right you will be evaluating the fatigue. Um, and so each of those uh, stress curves will generate its own fatigue life curve, or what we call SN curve. Um, S referring to the stress on the y-axis, and then N referring to the number of cycles on the x-axis, right? So what we're looking at here is how many cycles the part was able to withstand until it failed, right? So every uh, experiment, I load it at a different stress, and I just keep doing it until I get failure, then I get a data point, right? And I can sketch out this curve and see what the fatigue behavior of a particular material is. And um, some materials dis display what we call a fatigue limit, where you get down to a certain stress level, and essentially there is no reduction, further reduction in fatigue life. So if I were to keep my design below the fatigue limit, I essentially don't have to worry about fatigue because the part will never fail in fatigue, or at least not often. Um, so this would be indicative of steel. Um, other metals like aluminum um, don't show this fatigue limit, right? So if, as the cycles increase, um, at some point, uh, the stress will be uh, great enough to cause, cause failure, right? Um, and the fatigue limit, right, is somewhere between, say, a third to a half of the ultimate tensile strength. And um, I mentioned a minute ago, right, that um, every time we do a test, we get a data point. And this curve here looks nice and neat, right? But this is a plot of, say, you know, the, the median or the, you know, the average of all of those tests, right? Just like in any experimental work, there is scatter along this line. And so a more accurate interpretation would actually be to draw, say, upper and lower bounds, right, where we have, say, a 99% confidence interval and, like, say, 1%, where we would have this region where 99% of the tests are below a certain value and 99% and of tests are above a certain value. It gives you a high confidence that the fatigue uh, behavior of your particular um, application will fall somewhere um, in that range. And this, uh, this uncertainty is uh, right, typical of experimental work and is due to the fact that um, fatigue life is sensitive to a lot of factors that's, that are hard to closely control. Um, one thing is, uh, you know, uh, specimen fabrication. So, you know, how it's cut, how it's finished, where it comes from, uh, a lot of production, that sort of thing. Uh, the surface finish, uh, I think we'll talk about this a little bit uh, a little bit later, but um, the flaws on the surface, so scratches and dents and, and dings, right? Um, the, the, the smoothness of the surface is going to dictate the, have an impact on the, the fatigue life, um, right? Like going back to the lot and the production details, the, the, the metallurgy of these particular, these particular samples, um, how it was aligned in the fixture, Right, so if you don't put it in the fixture every time, you can introduce some variability. Um, and then also, even if you were able to do the test perfectly, right, there's the question of, well, how well does a, a, a force curve or a stress cycle like this, right, compare to the real world, right? Because in the real world, right, you have different duration of, of, of stress. It's not always the same every time. You also have varying stress levels, right? Say, so to go back to my aircraft wing example, right? 
Sometimes the plane is empty. Sometimes the plane is full, right? That means that you're going to have a different stress level for different cycles, and it's not going to be a repeated pattern. And so, you know, these fatigue life uh, curves, these SN curves, are really just kind of a best guess, um, you know, a guide um, to what your fatigue might actually look like. Oh, and uh, generally you, you kind of break up, when you look at these SN curves, um, to two regions, right? You, you think of uh, what we call low cycle versus high cycle fatigue. Um, low cycle is where you like, you, like it would sound, you have a low number of cycles. And uh, generally this is, uh, this corresponds with higher stresses. And what you're doing at these higher stresses is you're, you're actually plastically deforming the material slightly each time. And so since, you're, since you are uh, doing that um, every time, you, uh, you only have so much plastic deformation that you can, that you can do. Um, and so eventually um, your part fails because you've sort of strained it as much as, as it can. Um, high cycle fatigue, the stresses are lower, the cycle numbers are higher, um, and you're, you're, you're only in that elastic regime um, for, any, for any given cycle. Okay, but for a fatigue test, right, so again, we're talking about fracture tough or fracture mechanics. So uh, fatigue tests fail by cracks starting and then growing and then eventually leading to failure. So just like we've seen before, right, we have to have an initiation point. So again, this is a stress concentration, it's a scratch, a thread, a sharp transition, a dislocation, a dent, right, something like that where the crack starts, um, and then we get propagation, which instead of having it, you know, move uh, at a constant rate, say, you know, from a tensile test or something, right here, because we have a cyclic load, right, we have a more of a, an incremental or cyclic pattern to our crack propagation. Right, and we have what, um, what you can observe and have been called benchmarks, and striations, right? So a benchmark is sort of a group of striations. And a striation is the crack growth that occurs over a single fatigue cycle, over a single loading cycle, right? So every time I stress the part, right, I grow this teeny tiny amount of crack, right? And so if I do it a million times, eventually I've grown the crack enough to where the part fails. Um, and the benchmark would be a group of these striations. So you might think of it in terms of, say, you know, a benchmark might be an eight-hour shift of using a machine, and within that machine, within that eight-hour shift, say it was used a uh, hundred times. So I have a benchmark with a hundred striations in it, um, and then you know we turned off the machine and we went home to the next day, and so we would start a new benchmark uh, the next day with its own set of striations. Um, and these striations are really small, right? So, you know, you can see the benchmarks, you can see these bands with the naked eye, but to see the striations, right, require a, you know, a transmission electron microscope. Okay. So what factors affect fatigue? Well, I've already said um, that the stress Right, when I was talking about high cycle versus low cycle fatigue, right, a higher mean stress is going to decrease your fatigue life. Um, and that's within one curve, um, but also uh, has to do with the, you know, the mean stress of your, of your cycle, of your, your stress curve. Right, so as I go to uh, higher stresses, right, my fatigue, my SN curve is, is pushed down across the board. And this is, you know, to not to create confusion, right here we're talking about um, the mean stress. So that would be the average between the tension and compression part of the curve. And here is just the amplitude, right? That would be how much it, it increases above that mean stress, right? So um, 
here we're shifting the entire curve up. Well, we're shifting it up as we go from red to blue to green. And the stress amplitude for any one mean stress just means that I go to higher highs and lower lows, but the means remains constant across the whole curve. Okay, so higher stress decreases fatigue life. Um, so do uh, surface defects. So usually a part will see its maximum stress at the surface, right? You can imagine if you had some sort of an I-beam or a tube or something that's being bent, um, right? It's going to have the max stress at that, at that top surface and tension and uh, the max compressive stress at the bottom, but it's at the surface. And that means that surface defects uh, and, and, and stress concentrators like cracks and, or scratches and dings are going to be uh, your crack initiation sites. And so in your design, you can do, um, do some things to remove some of these possible stress concentrators. Um, and this is what was done in you know the shipbuilding, one of the things to reduce crack propagation. You also see this in you know pretty much all design um, is where if you can take a sharp corner and turn it into a gradual corner, right? Then I remove that corner as a stress concentrator. You can also do surface treatments, right? So if I have um, surface scratches, those can form uh, uh, initiation sites, but I could polish them out, right? Then then they don't. Then they're not there anymore and they, and they won't serve as that initiation site. I can also do surface treatments to add uh, a residual compressive stress. Right? So if I can put the surface in compression, when a crack forms, that compressive uh, stress that is um, there in the surface acts to push that crack closed again. And I can do that um, primarily uh, is primarily done through shot painting and carburization. Right? Carburization we've already talked about. This is sort of at an elemental level where if we diffuse carbon into say steel or into iron, right, we're going to create that compressive stress because we are putting carbon atoms in the interstitial. Right? So um, the atoms are, are being compressed sort of at an atomic level um, with shot painting, this is not a diffusion process, this is not treatment, uh, this is not a chemical treatment, this is a, a mechanical treatment. And here what we're doing is we are cold working or strain hardening the surface, right? So instead of adding uh, impurities like carbon that um, add energy into the crystal lattice itself here, we're just plastically deforming the surface, creating lots of dislocations um, that produce that strain energy um, in a similar manner, just with a different different mechanism, right? So if I look at an SN curve here um, and compare a regular sample versus one that's been shot peened, where you can see that you get, you get a, a good bump in fatigue life um, for a part that has been shot peened. Um, the environmental uh, effects also have an impact on fatigue life. So I can have additional stresses due to, to thermal effects. If I have a part that is, say, constrained, say, you know, tightly bolted into a, um, into a location, and so as it, as it heats up and cools down, right, that expansion and contraction, there's nowhere for it to go, and so that just becomes extra stresses within the, within the part that can lead to fatigue. Um, I can also have corrosion um, in addition to my fatigue. So uh, that happens um, in two ways. One is that I could have a corrosion pit that, that grows on the surface and that forms an initiation site. I can also have my corrosive uh, liquid or environment actually inside of my crack, right? So at that the front of that crack, I not only have... Uh, the forces that the part is is um, is under right the stress is present growing the crack but I also have chemical attack at the at the end so those two together can accelerate the crack growth okay the last topic here is creep so we've talked about uh, crack growth we've talked about fatigue 
and in, in neither of those did we consider the temperature, right? Those are just kind of basic, you know, uh, reasonable room temperature kind of temperature phenomena. Um, if we have a part that is operating at elevated temperatures, then we have to consider an additional mechanism called creep. And creep happens when you have uh, deformation um, not due to cyclic loading or crack growth not due to cyclic loading, but you have it, uh, you know, it, it actually is not, we're not talking about crack growth, we're talking about deformation, right? So it's, it, it's changing shape due to um, elevated temperature and being under static stress, right? So in our business, the example that um, is easiest to consider is a turbine blade, right? So turbine blades, especially when the, well, when the engine's operating, are spinning at a fairly constant speed, and so they're under a constant centrifugal, centrifugal force. Um, and they're also at uh, very high temperatures because they are within right, an operating engine. And so uh, to get the best uh, performance from these turbine blades and other materials that operate at high temperatures, right, we want to understand their creep characteristics. And this is done essentially by doing a tensile test, uh, a static uh, test at elevated temperatures. And what you're doing is you are measuring the strain, just like you would in a tensile test, um, only you are at elevated temperatures, and it's for a, uh, you're applying a constant load as opposed to a tensile test where you would have a constantly increasing strain. Um, and your time scale for a creep test is much longer than for a tensile test, right? A tensile test takes a few minutes, maybe. A uh, creep test, you're talking about hours or days. Um, and uh, when you look at the strain rate of a, of a creep test, um, there are three primary regions. Um, the first is, um, the, well, first of all, when you load the sample, you're going to get an instantaneous deformation, right? That's the elastic part. And then initially, you have a slowly decreasing strain rate in the initial stages. And this is due to the fact that as your material deforms, it's being work hardened, right? So it's getting stronger as it's deforming. Eventually, that reaches um, uh, the sort of you know dimension returns where you're no longer getting um, getting much stronger, and you reach um, you transition to a kind of a secondary regime where you have this steady state um, strain rate. Um, and here you have a balance. This is due to a balance of strain hardening and recovery, right? Remember, uh, recovery is kind of similar to say recrystallization, right? Remember where the last, uh, the last lecture we talked about um, cold working the material and then heating it up and recrystallizing those grains. Well, here it's a little bit different because it's sort of happening at the same time, right? We are, uh, it's under load and it's also at a higher temperature, right? So we are strain hardening and allowing that strain to be relieved through atomic motion, right? Because we have temperature and stress. Um, and so we sort of have this continual, this balance of the two forces that results in a steady rate. Um, and knowing what this rate is, is probably the most important piece of information that comes out of the creep test, because this allows you to estimate the lifetime of your part, right? If you know this strain rate, then you can say, okay, this part needs to be replaced after a thousand hours or 10,000 hours or whatever it is. Because um, what you want to avoid is entering into this third regime where the strain rate accelerates until it fails, right? And so especially for a turbine blade, you don't want that to happen, right? That's a bad day. <clears throat> and, you know, you start to uh, move away from the, you know, strain hardening recovery balance and get into more catastrophic um, microstructural failure modes, things like grain boundary separation, 
uh, crack propagation, uh, necking, right? So things speed up and they get a lot more serious in this third regime. So that means you want to, you, you want to avoid that. Um, and uh, creep is uh, stress and temperature dependent. And they, uh, and so if you increase either, um, you get a higher instantaneous uh, strain, right? That should make sense, right? If I have more stress, then my elastic deflection is, is greater. Um, my steady state uh, rate increases, right? So uh, if, I, if my steady state rate is a, is a product of strain hardening and recovery, right? Um, when I increase the stress, I'm strain hardening more. When I increase the temperature, I'm recovering faster, right? And so that strain rate is more uh, rapid if I increase either of those, or that that's that secondary um, um, rate of, of creep, um, and it also shortens the eventual lifetime right of the time to rupture. Um, and so when I'm doing a, a creep test, right, I'm getting out this strain rate data. And um, it's this strain rate that can give me insight into what is actually happening um, within, the, within the sample, within the material leading to failure. Essentially, what is the mechanism of failure, right? Is it, you know, things like grain boundary separation, um, cracking, necking, well, you know, what's, what's going on here? And... Um, you can model the behavior of the strain rate using an expression like this one where you have a constant times the strain to, um, to an exponent. And if I do a bunch of different creep tests and I get um, um, creep rates as a function of stress here, so I have this in my x value, this is my y value, then I can plot the, the data next to each other, right? Since I have an exponent, it helps to take the log of both sides. So then I just need to convert and plot my data in terms of uh, in a log log scale. Then that uh, gives me a line, right? Instead of a curve. And that line has uh, a slope and a y intercept. And I can see here that if I plot my data in this way, I can extract the, uh, the exponent from the slope and the uh, this other uh, constant from the y-intercept, right? So that allows me to figure out for a particular set of conditions and a particular material, right, what my exponent is, which is then tied to different creep mechanisms. Um, and uh, <clears throat> in doing creep testing, right, it's really hard to replicate 10,000 hours of jet engine operation without operating a jet engine for 10,000 hours. Um, that's a really expensive test to run. And so creep tests are generally not run at the operating temperature of the actual application because the test would just take too long. So instead, they're run at higher temperatures to accelerate the test and to do 10,000 hours, say, in a few days or a week or so. Um, and that's done through modification of your uh, strain rate um, relationship here, right? And you have the essentially the addition of an exponential term, right? And so this should look familiar. This form pops up a lot. We saw it back in the vacancies. We've seen it. We see it in diffusion. So we have this exponential dependence on an activation energy for whatever our process is, and then the temperature. Um, and so if we increase the temperature and we do creep tests at different temperatures, right, we can extract um, more than just the exponent, but we can extract um, this uh, uh, activation energy, which allows us to do creep tests at higher temperatures and extrapolate down to the strain rate at 
or say our operating temperature, even though the time scales um, would be much, much longer. So we can accelerate a test and get useful data about a much lower temperature and a much longer time. So, um, so what are some ways to increase creep resistance? Well, a lot of times it comes down to material selection. Right, you want to pick a material that has a high melting temperature. Um, so that um, the the bonds between atoms are are very strong and um, it takes a higher operating temperature for them to have enough energy to start to move around to have that recovery um, in addition to the strain hardening um, you want to have a high elastic modulus right so the higher the modulus the less likely you are um, to uh, to deform the material at a given stress. Um, you're also not going to have as much um, instantaneous deformation, right? Because your, your material is uh, stiffer, stronger. Um, you can do this through uh, solid solution strengthening or the addition of precipitates. This is something we'll cover um, in a few, in a lecture or two, I believe. Um, and in the case of, um, of turbine blades, right, one thing you can do, I mentioned up here that one of the mechanisms is grain boundary separation, right, grain boundary sliding, that sort of thing. Um, and so the grain structure of your material has a, a, a large bearing on the creep behavior. Um, for instance, in, in, initially, turbine blades were made from a conventional casting, right, where you pour mold material into a mold, you allow it to solidify however it's going to solidify. Um, what you get are lots of tiny grains that grow at the walls and, and typically grow inward. Um, and the creep behavior of a conventional casting is inferior to later, uh, later castings. Um, and what they found was that if you control the growth of the material more carefully, say for instance moving from a conventional casting to um, one where you are more carefully controlling the gradients, the thermal gradients, and how the grains nucleate and grow. If you grow the grains and have them then uh, start at one end and grow along the direction, right, then you essentially have grains that are long and thin and go parallel to the applied force, right? If I have a continuous grain all along the part, then I'm not going to have it sliding relative to another and leading to, to more creep. And if you take this idea to its logical conclusion, right, that would be having a turbine blade that is a single crystal of, of material, right? And that gives you superior creep resistance, um, but also requires much more um, control in the solidification process, right? It makes it more difficult to manufacture, but you get a superior product, right? And this is, you know, under conditions that are similar to what we see when we grow single crystal silicon, right? Anytime you want to grow one crystal, you need to be very careful about how you're nucleating and growing your grains, which usually is done through very careful control of thermal gradients, and it also takes a lot more time. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Okay, so that's all I had for uh, chapter eight, and uh, I'll get that video posted. Thanks.